you haven't figured it out by now, um, the people who have come back to make a new life and to rebuild the walled city of Jerusalem, um, they've demonstrated that they are a very, very unique people. Uh, these descendants uh, are people uh, who their, their forefathers and foremothers were actually taken into captivity about two generations beforehand, and they've come back under the leadership of a man named Nehemiah. And they want to res restore, they want to reestablish the center of life for the nation of Israel. And they, in particular, start by building this walled city, uh, Jerusalem. But they have to overcome some pretty serious obstacles. Everything from the threat of physical attack, from hostile neighbors, from financial hardship and struggle, there's this constant internal threat from discord, disunity. There's all kinds of community dysfunction. And there's this, uh, this intransigent, this, this stubborn history of spiritual disobedience. Now, now in the story, we've come to a point where the hard work, the laborious physical work, for all practical intents and purposes, it's all completed. And yet, and yet, there's still just a little bit more to be done. This is an opportunity for the, these descendants of people who were taken into captivity to proclaim a very, very clear message to the generations that are to follow regarding uh, God's faithfulness as compared to his fickleness, the fickleness of his people. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to those or for those who've returned, who've done this hard, this dangerous work, and they want to, this is a place where they can kind of put a new spiritual stake in the ground, in the soil of, of Judea, to publicly commit to living as the people of Yahweh in order that all of the surrounding people, the surrounding nations would know that there is no God like the God of Israel. So here's what I want you to think about today. When we engage in the work of God, God called the, the, the work that he calls us to. And when we fully surrender ourselves to him, we're to represent everything, everything God is and demonstrate to the world that God's a real God. So here's where we start in this story, beginning uh, in Nehemiah chapter 10. The people agree, the people make this agreement they agree that God's real. And this is what they said in Nehemiah. Right before we jump into chapter 10, the last verse of chapter 9, we read these words. In view of all this, the people say, we are making a binding agreement. We're putting it in writing. Our leaders, our, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And there's three things I want you to see immediately from this particular verse of Scripture. There's just three things. What happens is the people make this binding agreement. They put it in writing. And then they seal it. They put this seal, this official kind of stamp of approval on it. And all of it's done in public. It's not in private. The idea is that the people, the nation, they're making this, this statement. Specifically, the statement, it's called a covenant. Now, how many of you have heard the word covenant before? As a matter of fact, probably some of you live in neighborhoods with neighborhood covenants, right? A neighborhood covenant, rules, stipulations, expectations, and also consequences. If you don't do what you say you will do. If you don't abide by what you say you will abide by. The neighborhood covenant rules, they come get you. And in the ancient world, in the 5th century that this was written in, the 5th century before Jesus came, this was something that was pretty common. And these, uh, these covenants were based on someone who had power and someone who was weaker. So that's what a covenant is all about. The person who has the power and the person who doesn't. And in this case, the power, who do you think the power belonged to in this case? Who did the power belong to? Power belonged to God, right? That's who the power belonged to. And then the people are the ones who are agreeing to the covenant. They are agreeing in the fact that they are indeed the who partner. 
Which one? Are they the power partner? No. They're the weaker partner. And they agree to that. As a matter of fact, when these ancient treaties were created, there were certain rules, stipulations that the people promised to agree to abide by. And we'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. But there was also this very, very clear understanding of what would happen if the people did not keep their word, if the people did not keep their promise, if they broke their covenant, if they broke their promise. Friends, it is really, really tempting to look at this account here in the book of Nehemiah and observe that the people who are establishing this covenant of promises with the Lord their God. And you could almost falsely think that what they're committing to be and to do really has no relevance to us in the 21st century. Yeah, that's ancient stuff. That's stuff from the Bible. That doesn't really matter. But the fact is that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. The way that covenant keeping, the way that keeping our commitments relates to us here in the 21st century is this. In the same way that the nation of Israel would hold in high regard the law of Moses we should, in the 21st century, hold in high regard what God has said in his word, in the scriptures. In the same way that the nation of Israel would recognize that the surrounding non-Yahweh-worshipping neighbors would be watching the way that they live their lives, so we should, in the 21st century, be totally cognizant of people watching those of us who say we love Jesus. And in the same way that families and marriages were highly esteemed within the nation of Israel, so it should be with us that marriage and family matter tremendously to those of us who say we live for Jesus. Everything right down to the nation's commitment to the right of the aliens living among them, those who would be considered foreigners, this commitment to take care of creation, to take care of the resources, to manage what God has blessed us with. All of that stuff transcends time. They come into the 21st century, and they're valid for those of us who say we know and we love God. We should be committing to live by the very same promises that we're seeing here, made, that demonstrate that God's real. But like I said, the people, they do promise. They make this promise, God's real. Here's what we read. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, the temple servants, all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and their daughters who were able to understand all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and they bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, decrees of the Lord, our Lord. We promise, this is what they say, we promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or to take their daughters for our sons. Friends, it's pretty critical in this point in the book of Nehemiah to recognize now that the nation of Israel is super specific about their promises, the things that they will do, the things that they will not do as the people of Yahweh's. But I want to think, I, I kind of think it's critical to address something that really, when you read it at first, you're tempted to kind of see it as an inappropriate commitment to be made. You might think, well, that sounds really like something people shouldn't say. But if any of you are like most people, you have what's known as a trigger. How many of you have, you ever heard that word? I've, I've got a trigger, and I'm not talking about trigger on a gun, right? Something that triggers me. Something that initiates the start of a process. For some of us, maybe that trigger, maybe it's something we see, maybe it's something we hear or smell. It causes us to react in a particular manner or in a certain way. And friends, the nation of Israel in this passage, they recognize they have a trigger. And in particular, the trigger that they're dealing with is historical behavior 
that they and their ancestors regularly engaged in that caused them to disobey God. Triggering behavior that would cause them to turn their backs on the worship of God. Triggering behavior that they are now promising they will no longer engage in because this is what they say. We promise not to give our daughters to marriage and the peoples around us or to take their daughters for our sons. Here's why this small sentence in this passage about what the people promised to do mattered then and why it matters now. Friends, this particular pro prohibition they are seeking to enact, it had nothing to do with them maintaining some sort of ethnic purity, but rather it was about a commitment to maintain spiritual loyalty, ethical purity, and doctrinal integrity. The idea here is that the people who had compromised their faith was who they did not want to be anymore. Now, don't miss it, because it's important. There were those, in fact, who lived among the nation of Israel who had welcomed into their nation people whose commitment was not to the God of Israel, to the God who led them out of bondage in Egypt. But there were people who they would welcome into their community on one condition. And that condition was, you can become part of our community as long as you worship our God. That's it. Perfect example of that is Ruth from the Old Testament. Ruth was a Moabite, and they were notorious for worshiping all kinds of gods. And yet, when Ruth met Naomi, when she married a descendant of Jacob from Israel, she told Naomi that God, the God of Israel, would be her God. As a matter of fact, when Ruth became a widow and Naomi was ready to send her away, Ruth said to Naomi, no, no, let me stay with you. I will go where you go. Your God will be my God, even though she wasn't truly a descendant of Jacob. That was the commitment that she made. The people here in Nehemiah chapter 10, they're making a promise to God that they would in fact commit to being the people of promise, the people who then would ultimately welcome, bring into the world the Messiah for all the world. They would be a distinctive people. And that's exactly what you see reflected in the New Testament. That's what we're told all the time. Um, in particular, Paul warns the church in Corinth, in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Then the Apostle John, he also says, the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. They are not from the Father, but are from the world. And the Apostle Peter told the churches that he wrote to, he said, friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life in your neighborhood, so that your actions will refute their prejudices, then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. Friends, keep in mind, as believers in Jesus, we're not called to cut ourselves off from other people. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, we are actually called to continue to live and be amongst people. Believers are called to be known and to know those who do not believe. We are called to love others, to serve others, to tell others about Jesus. It's the whole idea of being in the world, but not of the world. And that's precisely what the nation of Israel is promising to do here in the 10th chapter of Nehemiah. There's a, another thing that I think comes to us from this particular uh, part of the book of Nehemiah. And this is, for me, this is the key. The people actually demonstrate that God is real. They actually live it out. And so here's what they said through Nehemiah. They said this, we also assume responsibility 
for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and every fruit tree. As it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle and our herds and our flocks to the house of God. So the priest ministering there, to the priest ministering there. What's happening here in very distinct ways draws us back to where we really kind of started in this message. This is where the people step up and they actually fulfill this obligation to keep the covenant. Remember I talked about covenant? Now they're going to do something. Now they're going to really live it out. That, and they're going to step up. They're going to fulfill their promises. This is where the promises that were made begin to take on a form, a, a very vital form. It's, it's not just about saying that they're going to live by a binding agreement, but putting flesh on what that binding agreement looks like every day. The people declare that they will give responsibly by giving of what is referred to as their first fruits. And this was their way of saying God gets what's best and God gets what's first. I read a little snippet from a blog. It said this, the concept of first fruits, it's rooted in biblical times. When people lived in an agrarian society, harvest time was significant because that's when the hard work of the farmers that they had poured into their crops all year long, that's when it begins to pay off. They were literally reaping what they had sowed. And God called his people to bring the first yield, the first fruits from their harvest to him as an offering. This was to demonstrate that the Israelites' obedience and reverence for God. It also showed that they trusted God to provide enough crops to feed their family. In doing this, in Nehemiah chapter 10, they're doing these three things. First, the people, the nation, they're declaring for all to hear that God is the giver of all good things. The second thing that they're doing is they're declaring that all they have actually belongs to God. Then the third thing, the people are declaring that God is worthy of the best that they have to offer. And living this way, the nation of Israel, they're demonstrating to the nations around them what makes them different, what, what makes them stand out, what makes them distinctive. The challenge for us is to do the same. And when we do this, when we live in a way that makes us distinct, we demonstrate that God is real. We demonstrate that God is worthy and deserves everything we have because the truth is that all that we have comes from God in the first place. I remember the first time I realized that I talked different. I mean, I was told I talked different. This was a phrase that was used on me. You talk funny. You talk different. That's what I was told. I could have been much more than eight or nine at the time. We had recently moved from New York City to Fayetteville, North Carolina. It was not a fun change <laughs> at all. All the kids in the school I attended, at least it seemed like all of them, they seemed to know that I talked differently. They were always asking me to say things. You, you, you know what I mean? They would ask me where I was from, and I would say New York. They would ask me who I lived with, and I would say my aunt. They would laugh, and they'd laugh. I never understood it, because as far as I was concerned, they were the ones who talked different. The one thing I've remembered all these years later, though, was the sting of being seen as different, of being made to feel as if being different was bad or negative. I think this memory that I have is one of the many reasons that the book of Nehemiah and in particular, this chapter of Nehemiah resonates with me on such a, a profound level. 
God has, in fact, called all of his people to be different, to be seen and to be known as different so that he might become known, famous to an unbelieving world. We're called to be different people. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you have made it so incredibly clear that we are to be different. That, and that being different, Lord, we tell an unbelieving world about who you are, your greatness, your goodness, your love, your mercy, and your compassion. And Lord, we would ask that as we seek to live for you, that we would do it not in a way that causes people to think we're better than. God, I know that that was probably a struggle for the nation of Israel as well. But God, your heart has always been that we would be different, that your people would be different, so that it would point to you. That it would lead other people to you because you love all people. God, we are grateful for the examples of faithful men and women through the scripture, but also through time and history. Lord, of what it, what it means to be seen as yours because we live differently. Now, God, uh, as we take time this morning to celebrate and to center the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, may we do so with hearts filled with gratitude. Because he has made a way for us to come to you through time and eternity. We pray this in his, his name. Amen. Amen.